Well, good morning. Uh, so good to be with you today on this August Sunday. Uh, can you believe that? We're just heading down this year and, and soon it will be a new year. Uh, but it is good that you're with us. If you're joining us here for the first time, welcome. It is good uh, that you have joined us. If you're online, thank you for being here as well. I uh, remind you that you are welcomed, that you are loved, that you are safe, and that God is well pleased with you. We continue our sermon series today uh, titled, Choose, Who Do You Want to Be? And I uh, begin with a story. The early morning dew melts away. The light begins to creep in and fills the skies. A new day is dawning. The fire is burning. The wood is crackling. A pot of water is on the grill, heating up until its boiling point. The water is now purified, cleansed, and it is ready for human consumption. What I'm describing to you is the opening scene of an episode from the History Channel's uh, show titled Alone. Now, Alone is an adventure reality show that invites individuals to self-document their journey and their struggles of surviving alone in the wilderness. It is usually filmed uh, in some remote location in the world, usually in indigenous controlled lands. But at this point uh, in the show, it's really about who will remain the longest alone, enduring the harsh weathers, uh, the harsh weather conditions, the, uh, the, the resources, the food resources, and of course, purifying water for survival. The contestant who wins receives a grand prize of $500,000. So clearly the winners of this show quickly learn to assess their surroundings, the weather, where to build a shelter. Of course, they seek to be near a water source, and they gain knowledge about where the predators may come from. They're also really good stewards with their limited sources, with their limited survival equipment and tools. Some contestants bring an ax, a bow and arrow, you know, a knife, a fire starter, and every contestant is allowed to only bring one photo with them. Certainly a challenging experience, and yet so fascinating to watch uh, because it's, it has this thing about it that invites us into their thinking, into their space. It's one of my favorite shows. Brenda and I sure have watched it. But I tell you about this show, this show this morning because I believe the winners, the good survivalists, the competent contestants, they teach us something valuable about human living. It's like they're pushed to the brink of humanity and they teach us that those who interpret the present moment, their current surroundings, the present realities, those who interpret it well, live with an eye on the future. They know what the future holds and therefore alter the way they live in the present. Today's sermon is titled, Good Interpretation Alters the Present. See, when one reads today's gospel reading, one can imagine these words coming out of the mouth of Jesus. One is left, I would say to you, pondering, wondering, shaking one's head. I don't know about you, but you can certainly be transported into this complexity about this wisdom and left with more questions and answers. I wonder how many of us heard today's scripture and were shifted one way and then immediately shifted another way. Could it be the language? Could it be the words that they do not align with the essence of Jesus we were taught about? 
You know, some of us know Jesus as unity, as baptism, as harmony, as water. Some of us know the laughing Jesus. You ever seen that image? The happy Jesus, the surfer Jesus. I'm not sure if you've seen those paintings. They're usually in churches all over the world. But such images and words um, can in fact embody Jesus. And yet, somehow, according to this wisdom, Jesus is something else. Did you catch it? Jesus is fire. Jesus is division. Jesus is accountability. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to earth. Jesus said, I've come to bring division, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. And then Jesus said, you hypocrites, you do not know how to interpret the present time. What is going on here? Do you know this Jesus that I'm explaining to you? Could it be that hypocrisy dwells among those who only acknowledge one side of Jesus. This is to say, there is another side to Jesus, which most of us have experienced by this moment, encountered in some ways. We have seen the signs, shall we say, but either we've ignored them, we've rejected them, or we've simply said, I can't accept that Jesus. And here, in this kind of space, is where I believe the divine enters the room. And I invite you this morning to open your heart, your mind, your soul to the divine, to the presence, to the creator, redeemer, and sustainer, the, the Holy Spirit that, that guides us and consoles us and comforts us and helps us, that spirit. Because today's wisdom is for those who are willing to be true, true students of Jesus, to learn that Jesus is fire, that Jesus has come to refine us, to purify us, to cleanse us, to shape us. See, I want to submit to you this morning that as the beloved people of God, we must live in the present for the eternal and not the temporal. Did you hear me? Let me say more about that. If you're in this room this morning, or if you're watching online, you should know something about the human narrative and how this story ends. The future of it all. Because the expected end, the expected future, should alter our current living. It should alter our present response. But what is the future? What is the end? What is the eschatology of it all, right? Well, firstly, it belongs to the divine. The end belongs to the creator, the redeemer, the sustainer, the three in one. And therefore, just like the Revelation passage describes, that in the end, there will be no more tears. That the divine will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Are you hearing me? That the end is no more pain, no more death, no more disease, all things being made new, all things being healed and put back together forever. So, if this is the end, if that is the future, if we look at our world today, can you see this new world order breaking in. An interpretation of such a new world order cannot be dismissed among all the other stuff that's happening in this world because we cannot live life without acknowledging the reality that is in front of our faces. You see, that's the hypocritical thing. The hypocrisy is to believe that the present order is the permanent order. There is a new world order breaking in. You know how I say, you know how I can confidently say that? I can say that because I see it here at Calvary by the Sea. I saw it in Phoebe and Shige speaking just a moment ago. There's a breaking in 
there is a new world order of justice, of kingdom, of the, of the basilaya of God, this expansive and generous love that continues to grow and grow and grow. But also there is this repentance, this confession, this lament, this healing and recon reconciliation that's breaking in. And this breaking in, guess what? It will create division. <laughs> it will create separation. A disjointedness for many people. Because many have given their allegiance and their loyalty already to the temporal earthliness of this world. The impatience, the selfishness, the my way or the highway, that is already been given over to this world. They want their reward now. They want it in this moment. I want the front chair of this table. And see, Jesus reminds us here, be aware of such a way of living. To give your allegiance and loyalty to earthly things is not the way. Instead, give your loyalty and allegiance to Jesus. To place Jesus above even the most dearest of things of this temporal world. Do you see how Jesus is fire? <laughs> Do you see how Jesus is division between the temporal and the eternal? And this is why good interpretation is needed this morning. I love indigenous peoples because they're good interpreters. Indigenous peoples have been interpreting weather for thousands and thousands of years, praying to the gods, working for the healing of the planet. And still today, indigenous peoples around the world continue to display activism because they already know the future. They already have interpreted the climate and they know it's in crisis. And still today, much of Christianity continues to misinterpret the signs of the climate. But you know, this shouldn't come as a surprise. Historically speaking, early colonizers, right? They came to steal the sacred lands of indigenous peoples, First Nations peoples, committed genocide, which most historians would agree. And any country or religion that boasts about how great they are, how successful, how exceptional they are, should first acknowledge that they are not too exceptional and not too successful because any country or religion that get free, gets free lands and gets free labor would be successful. You see, people of God, there is repentance that is needed. These colonizers, by the way, not only viewed indigenous people as something to conquer and oppress, but they also viewed the same way the forest, the land, the wild animal kingdom. They thought all of that also needed to be conquered, that all of that needed to be overcome. And the most puzzling thing of this all is that it was all done in the name of God in the name of a religion. Did you hear me? You know, I could go down several historical realities about the American Christianity and how it's committed violations against uh, all of God's creation and all in the name of God and religion. And it's such a contradiction. Still today, we see many of Christians who still are part of these dominant colonizing cultures and they continue to misinterpret the signs of the present times, ignoring and rejecting the voices and the interpretations of indigenous peoples, dismissing the heat waves of our time, the unprecedented rise of temperatures, the devastating rains of our times, the, the rising sea levels. We know this too well here in Hawaii, right? And still much of American Christianity refuses to acknowledge this, refuses to participate in the ongoing work and ongoing healing of this planet. You see, I guess what I'm saying to you this morning 
is that the hypocrisy of the American Christian church is that it will not accept the current interpretations of our time. That somehow they've given their allegiance and loyalty to the temporary, to the earthly, and cannot even see the future of what I'm explaining to you about this morning. And that somehow Jesus has come to burn away that, to cleanse it, to clean it, to purify it, to refine it. And just like there's ecosystems that need to be burned, right? It's the same thing for the American Christian church this morning. It's the same thing for all of us who call ourselves Christians or followers of Jesus or students of Jesus. It's like Jesus needs to come and burn away our misinterpretations. Like it's, it's like our faith needs to be refined. It's like our faith needs to be rejuvenated. It's like our faith needs to be purified. Do you see how Jesus is fire? Do you see how Jesus is fire? Because most of American Christianity still needs to be purified cleansed from all its sins, both historical and present, against indigenous peoples, against their lands. And as people of faith, we must repent. We must confess. We must lament. We must reconcile, specifically with indigenous peoples, but also with all creation and with all the wild animal kingdom. Why would we do that? Because that's what the owner wants. That's what the Creator wants. Good stewardship of all creation, good interpretation of all, the eternal of the future and of the end. You know, I love Jesus. He's the greatest interpreter of all time. The goat, the greatest of all time. Clearly spent his life for the future, lived his life for all creation, gave himself for eternal things, demonstrated love and grace by dying on a cross, took away our sins and failures, burdens, mistakes, our misinterpretation, and gave us his forgiveness, his successes, his righteousness, and resurrected three days later to give us the greatest day in history. Jesus is the apex of reality. Jesus is the omega point of history, giving us liberation and salvation. But what shall we do this morning with such good news, with such liberation, with such freedom? Perhaps we choose faithfulness to Christ, allegiance to Jesus, to do what the owner wishes us to do. Even if it's countercultural, even if it's unpopular, even if it's divisive, even if it burns, We learn to hold on to both sides of Jesus, fire and ice. And we say, oh God, help us to choose you. Help us to be good students, to give our allegiance to you and our loyalty. Come and shape us like water is shaped. Come and burn us, purify us, melt away all of our misinterpretations and give us a heart of confession to acknowledge where we have missed the point. Give us a heart of lament. Give us a heart of reconciliation. Come and melt away the things that get in the way of you. Let us give our hearts to you this morning for the sake of all creation. And to this, all God's people say, Amen.